Good afternoon and good morning to those that aren't on the East Coast. My name is Heidi Leftwich. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts and an SMFM Education Committee member. I'd like to welcome everyone to the SMFM webinar on COVID-19 and pregnancy, preparing your OB units. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to share a few notes about today's webinar. We are using computer audio for today's lecture. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand from the SMFM website tomorrow by 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Following this lecture, there'll be a Q&A segment. You may enter your questions into the chat box on the right of your screen or submit questions anonymously through the QA feature to the bottom of your screen. In the midst of this global pandemic, I want to personally thank each of our speakers for giving their time to help us better prepare our own units for success. Today we have SMFM President Dr. Judette Lewis, Chair of the OBGYN Department at the University of South Florida. We also have the Vice Chair of the SMFM Education Committee, Dr. Chris Hahn, who's the Associate Professor and Fellowship Director at UCLA. And we have Assistant Professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, Dr. Kimberly Ma. And with that, please welcome first Dr. Chris Hahn, who will start our webinar. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on such short notice, um, and especially during a time when everyone is incredibly busy. So I'm just going to start really quickly with a quote. Know the enemy and know yourself, and in a hundred battles you will never be in peril. And this seems particularly appropriate right now because we are dealing with a pandemic that we do not fully understand yet, and we are all finding deficiencies within our own systems that we are actively trying to correct. So with that, the objectives of today are to fully or to understand more uh, regarding COVID, to summarize available guidance from SMFM and from CDC and ACOG. We're going to review an, uh, an algorithm from University of Washington where they have been dealing with this for several weeks. We're going to answer some specific questions or raise some specific questions that each of us should be talking about within our own groups. We'll talk about some upcoming research efforts, and um, lastly, we'll close with Dr. Lewis's president's address. And I just want to note that the slides will be released um, publicly to everyone at the end of this lecture um, once I get SMFM's approval. So this class of this family of viruses is known as coronaviridae or coronavirus. There's four subclasses, and the two that we are worried about in humans are the alpha class, which are the human coronaviruses that we know. These cause mild respiratory illnesses with no lasting sequelae. The beta class are the zoonotic coronavirus, and that's what we are currently dealing with. Within this class, there are four lineages, and the B lineage is the one that has caused um, the most issues for us. In 2003, this caused SARS coronavirus um, episode, pandemic number one, and then we are currently dealing with the second version of that. The C lineage causes the uh, Middle, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Now you'll notice in literature and in media multiple different names for this, and I just want to raise um, the uh, evolution of this. So NCOV stands for Novel Coronavirus 19, and that was the name initially assigned by the virologists in Wuhan when they first noticed a virus developing. Once they sequenced the virus, they noticed that there was enough similarity to classify it under the B lineage, and therefore it became SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 is the disease that is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we'll talk a little bit about the virus first. This virus has a host cell receptor of angiotensin converting enzyme 2, the same as SARS-CoV-1. This has significant sequence similarity. In some reports, 79% up to, 60, to 86% uh, sequence similarity to the SARS-CoV-1 and 50% to the MERS-CoV. The R0 for this, and that's what epidemiologists call the basic reproduction number, is 2.2 with a confidence interval of 1.4 to 3.9. What this R0 is, is the average number of individuals that will be affected um, from infected from a single individual on average in a fully susceptible population. And so COVID-19 is listed here with R0 of 2 to 3. You'll see that seasonal influenza is a little bit less transmissible, whereas SARS is more and measles is significantly more. The average incubation for this virus is approximately five days with a range of two to 14 days. And the viral shedding is about 20 days with a maximum of 37 days reported from the onset of symptoms. 
The patient characteristics that have been reported out of China so far show a range of about 10 to 89 years of age with a median of 59. Um, and there was a, a male predisposition in um, the cohorts that have been reported. Within hospitalized patients, the average age ranges from 49 to 56. Um, and this is important to note for our audience because this is not the age group that we typically deal with. About half of these patients will have an underlying comorbidity, but that is where we come in as maternal fetal medicines, is that we may have younger patients, but we have more patients with more comorbidities. And again, men are noted to be more frequent and rarely children, although there needs to be an asterisk with that because just this week there was a report from China uh, describing uh, COVID in children ranging from age 5 to 18. Transmission of COVID-19 is thought to be through respiratory droplets, and this requires prolonged unprotected contact between the infector and the infectee. So a lot of the hysteria that has developed in the media may not be as warranted as we think. Aerosol transmission is also possible, but believed to be only the case with aerosolizing procedures such as bronchoscopy or intubations. And this does require elevated aerosol concentrations in closed spaces. An article just this week out of, uh, I believe it was New England Journal, showed that when aerosolized, the virus can stay in the air for up to three hours. Fomites have also been described to carry the virus, but transmission via fomites is less certain. And as of today, there are no reports of transmission via airborne modalities, and the WHO and CDC stand firmly behind that. Um, and there are no fecal oral transmission reports, although uh, viruses have been found in feces. The signs and symptoms that we typically see usually present with fever and dry cough, with these being the two primary symptoms, and then more nonspecific symptoms such as fatigue, malaise, uh, myalgia, chills, nausea, vomiting, sputum production, and shortness of breath. You'll note here that diarrhea can show up in 3.7%, and there are some newer studies that are now showing that perhaps this may, may be um, an even more important presenting symptom. In terms of the abnormal signs that we see uh, once a patient presents to us, in some reports, chest x-rays have been reported up to 100% of cases, um, and in some cases with uh, more asymptomatic or uh, milder symptom individuals, lower rates. Now, this is what I want to bring up specifically for labs, um, and some of you have, may have seen this on social media already, but there's talk of lymphopenia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia as being important in the diagnostics. Acute respiratory distress is also, um, has been described in 17 to 29% of the hospitalized. So going, delving a little bit deeper into the laboratory abnormalities. Lymphopenia, the incidence rates, and, um, and I combined the report from, in AJOG from Rasmussen and Jameson um, with one of the reports in China. The incidence rates of lymphopenia seems to be somewhere between 35 to 70%. For leukopenia, 9 to 33%. A hematocrit decrease of 41 to 50 percent, thrombocytopenia in 4 to 35 percent, transaminitis in 4 to 22 percent. Now I put a red box around these three because a decrease in hematocrit, a decrease in platelets, and an increase in LFTs in our audience immediately triggers thoughts of preeclampsia or um, severe ends of the spectrum for that disorder. So it's important to think of this as possibly a mimic of preeclampsia, although we do not have enough data yet. In the ICU populations, procalcitonin has also been described to be increased in up to uh, in an average of 5 to 5, 5.5%. Uh, 5 if it is a severe patient, 14% um, will have an elevation in procalcitonin in up to a quarter of ICU patients. If we look at the actual laboratory results, so in non-severe individuals, white count seems to be hovering around five, um, with 28% uh, of these patients having um, white counts lower than four. In severe individuals, um, 3.7 is the average for white count, with 61% uh, um, having a white count less than four. Lymphocyte decrease is again also noted with severe range of disorder showing uh, more lymphocytopenia, and the platelet decrease is usually fairly mild down to the 130 uh, range in severe patients. The hemoglobins that have been reported are from non-pregnant series, and therefore these are obviously higher than what we see in many of our pregnant patients at term. 
This is a diagram from WHO regarding the progression of disease um, through the process. So if we look from the left side of the screen, onset from, um, from viral contact to development of symptoms is usually about one week. Again, we said five, point, uh, five was approximately the average. Approximately 80% of patients will have mild to moderate disease that spontaneously resolve, as you can see from these green arrows. Uh, recovery is highly likely in mild to moderate disease. 13.8% will de develop severe disease and 6.1% will develop critical disease requiring mechanical ventilation. Recovery um, in the mild, to moder mild range is about two weeks and in the moderate and beyond range is about three to six weeks. And that is part of the burden on the healthcare system is the prolonged hospitalizations that may be required in some of these individuals. In terms of case fatality rates, and I, I, all of us have seen varying numbers throughout the literature, um, the current CDC quote is 1%, uh, approximately 1%, and a JOG article from uh, February also supported that number. Um, these are some epidemiologists who came together to gather up the worldwide reports. And what they showed was that the initial earlier reports from throughout China um, were uh, somewhere between 1% to 3.5%. In the other parts of the world, 4%. Um, on the Diamond, uh, on the Princess cruise ship, uh, the fatality rate was 0.6%. So currently they're recommending a broad range of case fatality rates of 0.25 to 3%. And part of the reason for the differences in case fatality rate reports is a matter of the denominator. So at the top here, we have just the Wuhan cohort with a case fatality rate um, initially reported as high as 12%. But as this spread and testing became more widely available, the, desk, the case fatality rates dropped. And again, we think we are approximately somewhere in the one to three range right now. Now, risk factors for death. Um, and again, these are non-pregnant patients, in, uh, mostly elderly. What uh, the Chinese cohort uh, showed is that for every one year increase in age, there is an odds ratio of 1.1 of demise. So as the older you get, the more likely. For comorbidities that are present, COPD has been shown to be, um, uh, to increase your risk along with diabetes and hypertension, which um, diabetes and hypertension is seen frequently in our population. Furthermore, they looked at a SOFR score, which is sequential organ failure scoring, and they showed that an increase in SOFR score can increase your risk of death. And I wanted to point this out, which is the sex. As we mentioned earlier, the current thought is that man, men are more predisposed to severe morbidity, um, but it's important to remember that a lot of these earlier cohorts are from China, um, where the population makeup is slightly different uh, than uh, here. Now, in terms of laboratory abnormalities that may uh, prognosticate um, high morbidity, uh, white count. Again, we noted that uh, leukopenia is shown to be present in many of these individuals. However, if you see a high white count in a COVID patient, that should be highly concerning um, and possibly due to secondary infections from bacterial pneumonia. Transabinitis, meaning liver effects from COVID, is, has also been associated. And all of these factors are um, noted to be statistically significant in terms of risk for demise. And that includes a creatinine of 1.5 or above. I uh, converted this number over. An elevated LDH, elevated creatinine kinase, elevated cardiac troponin, elevated D-dimer, elevated prothrombin time. Um, elevated serum ferritin, and then IL-6. And we'll come back to this I concept of IL-6 uh, in a few slides. This seems to be the time course that is happening with these individuals with presenting um, on, uh, sorry, uh, with uh, virus contact on day one, symptoms presenting at this point, usually with dyspnea first, um, with cough and fever potentially uh, earlier. And the morbidity seems to be happening around week two and beyond. So this is the concept of the cytokine storm that has been brought up, and that is that these antigen presenting cells are presenting the viral um, proteins to, to the, um, our immune system, and that for some reason results in a very significant inflammatory response with IL-6 being significantly elevated, IL-8, IL-1 beta. 
So where are we right now with um, the statistics in the U.S.? As of this morning, the total number of cases is reported at 7,000, the total number of deaths around 100. Um, we currently have 54 jurisdictions uh, reporting, and that includes Puerto Rico, Guam, and U.S. Virgin Islands, along with Washington, D.C. The sources of exposures within the U.S. population seem to be uh, due to travel or close contact, although we still have a large percentage where epidemiologic risk factors have not been fully teased out or at least reported. And these are the geographic distribution of our cases right now, with the bicoastal um, uh, states more affected. So what do we know about COVID during pregnancy? And there is only two major uh, case series that have been reported, both out of China. This first one is by Liu et al. out of Guangzhou. And they had a case series of 13 patients ranging from 22 to 36 years old. The majority of them were in the third trimester with only two under 28 weeks. None of these patients had any underlying comorbidities. They presented with symptoms that were classic fever and dyspnea. Um, and one was asymptomatic and was screened purely due to close contact. All of them had close contact with either somebody from Wuhan or were in Wuhan um, uh, within two weeks before the onset of symptoms. These patients, um, out of the 13, three were uh, symptomatically improved and discharged home prior to delivery. Um, Ten of them delivered, all by cesarean, but that might be due to regional differences. The reported indications for um, delivery were non recurring fetal heart tracing, preterm premature rupture of membranes, and one for um, uh, stillbirth. Um, preterm labor has been, was reported in about 50% of these patients, and there was one that required an ICU admission with multi-organ failure, including ARDS, and as of last report, was still on ECMO. None of these cases had any evidence of vertical transmission. The second series was out of Wuhan um, by Chen et al. And they had a series of nine, again, similar age range, but a later gestational age in this cohort, also healthy um, women. What they noted was that fevers could develop for the first uh, time postpartum. So on admission, there were 78% of patients with fever ready. Um, and two of the patients who did not have fevers on admission developed them postpartum. Other symptoms that were reported were myalgia and malaise, cough, dyspnea, sore throat, and diarrhea in this cohort. And again, all of them had an epidemiologic risk factor via contact with an infected person or travel to Wuhan. This is the table that they presented showing the indications um, for C-section in this cohort. And you'll see all of them had pneumonia listed as an indication. Two had his um, fetal distress. There was one with transaminitis. Um, so it, it's hard for us to tease out without the full data regarding whether how many of these were indicated um, uh, cesareans. Now these were the laboratory abnormalities from this cohort and you'll see that um, these white counts are slightly higher than the uh, uh, non-pregnant cohorts and that makes sense in our pregnant population. Leukopenia was, um, was rep reported in 78% Lymphocytopenia in 56%, elevated C-reactive protein in 75%, ALT in 33%, and all of them had um, confirmatory PCR testing for SARS-CoV-2. These patients, again, as I mentioned, were all delivered by C-section, and four of them were late preterm with also no vertical transmission reported. And lastly, this is not a pregnancy cohort. This was in the pediatric literature and seems to um, not have been uh, put out in the media as much. But in this cohort, there were nine pregnancies with 10 neonates, and um, symptom onset was noted before delivery in four of these moms, on the day of delivery in two, and in three in the postpartum period. The symptoms were fever and cough, and one had diarrhea. Four of these patients were term, and six were preterm. The earliest was 34 weeks. Now, interestingly, the, um, the neonates had some symptoms that were noted too. And so six of these neonates had shortness of breath. There were fevers, thrombocytopenia, tachycardia, and pneumothorax reported in uh, some of these neonates. All of them, interestingly, had swabs at birth that were negative. So this tells us this is not vertical transmission and most likely transmission during the initial days of life. There was one reported death of the 34-week 
um, fetus that uh, resulted in multi-organ failure, DIC, and shock on day of life eight. Now, those, that's all the data we have currently on pregnancy in COVID. So we therefore have to look back historically at the other two cousin viruses to determine what has been seen in those. The largest series in the SARS-CoV data, um, uh, data from 2003 was with only 12 patients. And the complications that were seen were similar, bacterial pneumonia superimposed on the viral pneumonia, ARDS, acute renal failure, mechanical ventilation, and sepsis. Um, they also reported uh, rates of first trimester miscarriage in patients who were infected. There was a 25% case fatality rate in this cohort. For the MERS, similar case fatality rate of 23%, and they additionally reported intrauterine fetal demise and preterm delivery as potential outcomes. So it does appear that our current data shows that SARS-CoV-2 might be more mild in pregnant women than SARS-CoV-1 and MERS were, but our data is still limited and we do need more information about how susceptible pregnant women are and how severe they are, the infections may be. And part of the problem with a lot of these case series is that the denom denominator remains unknown. Now to touch upon vertical transmission again, um, I mentioned that in the three reports, none of them had vertical transmission um, reported. Um, there, however, um, and the same has been for the MERS and the SARS-CoV-1. However, there are now two reports in the media about neonates who've been diagnosed with um, SARS-CoV, with carrying SARS-CoV-2. We don't know about the severity of their symptoms. The report out of China from February uh, was a neonate that was swabbed at birth, but unfortunately the swab was not sent. And so the positive test came out at 36 hours after birth. And therefore the most likely scenario there is postnatal transmission. Um, the second report we don't have much data on right now, but was just reported a few days ago out of England. And this um, fetus, uh, this neonate was swabbed immediately after birth. But again, we do not have any formal um, uh, communications regarding the details of that case. So just to keep everyone on the lookout for new information. So that then takes us to what our guidelines currently say. And I'm going to start with the CDC guidelines on who to test. The CDC website is constantly evolving. And as of this morning, I checked again, it says clinician judgment should be used to determine if a patient has signs or symptoms compatible with COVID-19. Now, all of us who are dealing with patients right now know that it's not as easy as that. So the CDC says to prioritize testing for those who have symptoms, signs or symptoms, and who are hospitalized, who have signs or symptoms or who are at risk, and or, um, or who have signs or symptoms with epidemiologic risk factors. And that includes healthcare personnel with contact to patients who are under investigation or confirmed or travel to affected geographic areas. Now, more importantly, and the reason we can't generalize this is that every Department of Public Health in every region has their own specific testing criteria. And much of that depends on the availability of testing in your specific area. So this is just a sample one from LA County, but I encourage everyone to look up your own regional criteria and to be in touch with your Departments of Public Health. Now, guidance from ACOG and SMFM. This flow chart was released just recently and talks about how to triage patients. I won't go through every single one of these points, but this will be in the Dropbox at the end of the talk. So essentially we assess symptoms and if they have no symptoms, they undergo routine prenatal care. If they have evidence of um, disease severity, meaning they are short of breath, um, they can't walk a block, there's blood, hemoptysis happening, then we elevate their risk and we ask them to seek care. And if the suspicion is high, they seek care in an emergency department or an area where they're capable of doing testing. If there are no positive symptoms, then you assess their risk factors. Or, um, and if they have risk factors, then they're placed in the moderate risk category and they can be seen in uh, ambulatory setting because they are at risk for COVID, but they are not severely symptomatic. And if they do not have any comorbidities and do not have any severe symptoms, then they fall into the low risk category. Next will be guidance from Society for Maternal Me Fetal Medicine. This was written by Dr. Brenna Hughes and Dr. Daughters Katz. Um, and it was just updated, I believe, two days ago on the SMFM website with additional Q&As. 
Um, and this is also partly based on the February article from Rasmussen and Jamison in AJOG. So the general principles that we should be deal taking when dealing with a patient who is under investigation or confirmed to have COVID is um, prevention of spread. So these patients should either wait in a well-ventilated area or better yet, not wait at all. They should be kept six feet away from others. They should have a face mask on as soon as they enter your healthcare facility. They should be rapidly triaged. And in the uh, Rasmussen Jameson article, uh, it says to isolate as soon as possible in an airborne infection isolation room. There's an asterisk next to that because again, as CDC and WHO are saying, they do not believe that this is aerosolized and therefore we do not need a negative pressure room for patients who are undergoing investigation. The CDC recommends that you follow their infection prevention and control procedures, and I believe Dr. Ma will touch upon some of those, um, and to limit visitors to the patient rooms, and of course, to contact your own hospital ID. In terms of testing, they mentioned to collect and send relevant specimens, and I'll talk about what relevant specimens are on the next slide, and to screen for other viral respiratory infections and bacterial infections. There have been reports of co-infection with influenza and uh, coronavirus simultaneously. Fetal heart rate tracing, um, monitoring, and contraction monitoring uh, should be applied if appropriate as deemed by the obst obstetrical team. Most important in the management is early oxygen therapy with a target of greater than 95%. Early mechanical ventilation um, should also be applied with evidence advancing respiratory failure. So in terms of swabbing, um, currently the CDC recommends only sending an upper respiratory nasopharyngeal swab. The oral pharyngeal appears to be less important and due to the limitations in our testing capabilities along with our um, supplies, it's important that we try to minimize the number of samples that are sent. In terms of swabbing, and um, uh, Dr. Neil Silverman, one of the ITSOG former board members, likes to always remind everyone that when you swab, the swab needs to go all the way back into the nasopharyngeal cavity in both nares. In general, if they're not coughing, they are, you're not doing the swab right. And so that's part of the reason why personal protective equipment is necessary when you are doing these swabs. In terms of sputum, currently there is no recommendation to induce sputum in any of these individuals, but if they are productive, you can send a sputum off uh, for testing. The type of swabs that should be used are synthetic fiber swabs with plastic shafts. And CDC makes a very clear note of that. Do not use calcium alginate swabs or swabs with wooden shafts as they can contain substances that would activate the virus and potentially inhibit the testing and cause false negatives. Important to pro maintain proper infection control while collecting this specimen. Place the swab immediately into the sterile container with transport media. And this is what the CDC sam sample kit looked like, but um, regionally many centers are developing their own now. In terms of general principles of management, IV fluids should be used very conservatively unless the patient is deemed to be cardiovascularly unstable. Antibiotics should be considered, especially in patients with signs of pneumonia um, and, and potential sepsis, and that is because of the risk of bacterial um, superinfection. Given that influenza A is still around, um, you can absolutely consider oseltamivir uh, while waiting for results to come back. And if there is septic shock, prompt targeted management for protocols um, is recommended. In terms of steroids, and we'll touch upon this at the very end of the talk, um, currently the uh, Rasmussen Jameson um, article says to, do not, to, to not routinely use corticosteroids, and we'll talk about the literature for that later. Notify, notifications and consultations should be obtained with neonatology, in fact, uh, intensivists as necessary, anesthesia and nursing, and hospital infectious disease. Delivery timing, there is no mandate um, uh, on when to deliver. And of course, this is based on our own obstetrical expertise to determine the gestational age, the maternal condition, the fetal stability, and the maternal wishes. And most importantly, to remember to communicate with the family. And I argue, argue that uh, communication with patients should also be um, noted right now, especially since um, uh, we've all seen some fear of contact with patients with COVID. Now, guidance on infection prevention comes from the CDC. 
Um, they recommend that every institution redo the basic and refresher trainings on uh, personal protective equipment and to ensure that they have sufficient and appropriate PPE supplied and positioned at all points of care. There are also processes now to protect newborns, as I mentioned from the zoo study, there uh, is potential, there's risk of neonatal infection. Now, there are some um, considerations that need to be made for pre-hospital uh, um, patients. So for somebody who contacts you saying that they have symptoms, um, the obstetrician should notify labor and delivery or triage uh, that there is a patient coming in. As I mentioned, identify an appropriate room and ideally bypass triage or bypass a waiting room if possible. And again, to ensure that protective personal equipment are readily available for the personnel who are taking care of this patient. For those patients who are arriving by EMS or interhospital transport, the EMS clinicians must notify the healthcare facility in advance. And just as with somebody who's ambulatory coming into your setting, they should be kept separated from other patients as much as possible. Family members should not ride in the transport vehicle if possible, but if they insist, they must wear a mask and ideally eye protection, um, and then follow your own hospital's transport policies and otherwise. In terms of the mother-baby contact recommendations right now, temporary separation is what we recommend, and that is separate, a separate isolation room for the infants while the mom remains either under investigation or COVID-19 uh, confirmed. Now, we must discuss these risks and benefits for temporary isolation with the mother along with the data on uh, potential risks to neonates, which is not fully elucidated yet. Um, but once your hospital epidemiology team deems the mom's transmission-based precautions to be able to be lifted, the neonate can be brought back. The decision to discontinue separation should be made on a case-by-case -case basis and again, co consulting the uh, folks in your hospital ID or epidemiology to help you make that decision. Um, and along with their risk of transmission, whether they're still symptomatic and coughing. Visitor policies have now been instated for many institutions across the US and that is to limit uh, visitors to the postpartum unit to only healthy parents or caregivers. Um, many institutions are limiting to one to two and that's something for each of you, your institutions to decide. The visitor should wear appropriate um, PPE and um, uh, if the mom is expressing milk, and we'll talk a little bit about breastfeeding, um, then uh, a healthy family member is encouraged to be there to do the feeding. In terms of co-location or rooming in, that is based on the mother's, um, if, if it is based on the mother's wishes, saying the mother is unwilling to temporarily isolate, or your facility is just out of room or does not have the capability, then measures must be taken within the room to limit exposure of the newborn to the virus. So physical barriers, such as a curtain, the newborn should be kept six feet away from the ill mother. When the mother is coming near the uh, neonate, a face mask and ha uh, good hand hygiene should be practiced. In terms of breastfeeding, there are limited studies again. Um, and we have uh, some studies on SARS-CoV and some studies from SARS-CoV-2 but virus has not been detected in any of the breast milk. So during periods of temporary separation, moms should be encouraged to express breast milk. There should be a dedicated breast pump that stays in the room with her. She must practice good hand hygiene as she is collecting the sample and all parts that come in contact with the breast milk um, should be thoroughly washed and the entire pump should be disinfected per the manufacturer's instructions. In terms of direct feeding, if the mother is, wants to, um, uh, to directly breastfeed, she must wear a mask um, and practice good hand hygiene. And I would recommend also uh, breast hygiene and um, cleaning down the skin prior to feeding. Um, Express breast milk should then be given to the newborn by a healthy caregiver. And with that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Dr. Ma um, so that she can tell us what the University of Washington has been doing. Okay, I uh, first would like to thank the society for uh, uh, providing the support for today's timely webinar. Um, at the University of Washington, we have published our institutional protocols that is meant to, to be a starting point for others. 
Our protocols are institution specific and may not apply to your specific situation, but we also didn't want others to start from scratch. As we learn for, for, um, from new information daily, please check the date that you access the document off this website. This website not only provides uh, pregnancy protocols, but also ambulatory, newborn, PPE, emergency room, intensive care guides, and others. Um, we started our first draft of our protocol the first week of March, which now seems like ages ago, and our triage consists of the severity of symptoms as well as the maternal comorbidities, which is listed on the side. Um, uh, we also attempt to uh, triage the location of where these patients should be seen, whether it is inpatient, ambulatory, or drive-through testing. Uh, maternal comorbidities are listed here, and this is not an exhaustive list. Um, and obviously clinical judgment should be used for the side of evaluation or if there is uncertainty. Um, we also acknowledge that the population within the United States is a much different po uh, population compared to the case series that was published in China, which is a predominantly healthy uh, cohort, and just wanted to acknowledge that in our uh, triage system. As we know, ACOG uh, and SMFM came out with their triage system, which Dr. Han just previously went over, um, that can also be adopted for your institution. Uh, this is our current draft model for our uh, cesarean section uh, COVID patient. Um, this includes uh, breakdown by role, uh, where the patient is actually located or the timing of surgery, including the pre-op, the scrub area, the intra-op, and the PACU and post-op period. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we also highlighted where the observed donor doffer is needed in all stages of the procedure that's highlighted in green, as well as what we have to do with our specimen handling that is highlighted in yellow. So now to go over a few things that have worked well and some challenges we have encountered in the last couple of weeks. So the first um, would be to divide and conquer. Within our division, we have uh, four people that are spearheading the COVID uh, triage algorithms for both inpatient and outpatient, uh, whether, this is, whether this is arranging meetings with our L&D nurse coordinator, developing protocols, or rescheduling patients to telemedicine. This has proved to be essential within our division. Second, for labor and delivery protocols, we've implemented a multidisciplinary approach. We had um, multiple Zoom meetings with our anesthesia colleagues, our nursing colleagues for both pediatrics and labor and delivery, and our NICU colleagues in order to uh, come up with a stepwise fashion of what we will do for delivery for these COVID or PUI patients. Third, at the University of uh, Washington, we have a central institutional website for updated guidelines and protocols, and this has proved to be essential. Um, it avoids me trying to dig through my email or search through my email of what the latest protocol may be, and instead we have one place that we can utilize all of these. We also know that, um, you know, as an MFM, that I can, util I can then look up the ICU protocol or look at the immunosuppression protocol that was developed by the, uh, our oncology colleagues, and that way we can work off each other as well. Uh, we've also had clear and consistent frequent communication. Our institution sends out at least a daily email every day about the coronavirus update and any um, updates to staffing. Um, our division has now gone to twice weekly 30-minute division meetings via Zoom in order to ensure that we all have um, the at most adequate and most up-to-date information. Um, we've also worked with our institution leadership. So within the University of Washington, we worked with our leadership in order to ensure that the, we just started an ambulatory drive-through testing site uh, earlier this week and to ensure that pregnant patients for mild symptoms could also be tested there. Uh, one key vital point has been simulation or dry run or in-person training. So first of all, for those of you who have not done PPE donning or doffing, it is an extensive multi-step process. There are videos available, but this does not substitute in-person training, which is recommended. Uh, the link here for the CDC uh, personal protective equipment for COVID-19 is up to date since last month. But again, I, I recommend those that have in-person training available to, um, to go to those trainings. 
Our institution currently has daily training from 10 a.m. to 7 a.m. for 21 hours out of the day, where we have training on the top of the hour every hour. We've also gone through our cesarean section protocols by doing a dry run with our, our nursing and anesthesia colleagues, and it did prove that we did have um, some gaps in our protocol that needed to be uh, looked at. We are also uh, considering having a dedicated COVID team within our obstetrics um, department, and that way that ensures that the people are most up to date to, um, on information, on data, and also in allowing for a dedicated team to update our protocols. We've been able to transition easily to telemedicine for our outpatient visits in that we actually were fortunate in already having telemedicine established. And within our institution, we've had um, support for employee COVID-19 testing, and there's also an institution website for resources for childcare or running errands for all employees for either offering care or needing care, and actually some of our um, medical students who are no longer on clinical rotations have been offering their support. However, we've not been without our challenges for the last couple weeks, and um, my hope is that by sharing these challenges that you perhaps can also learn from them as well. Obviously, the most uh, challenging aspect of this uh, pandemic is that information is changing constantly, and we are al always getting updates, whether it's by the hour, via social media or via email. Um, there are challenges to our medical decision making and their resources, whether it's staffing, uh, PPE allocation, or blood bank res uh, resources. You know, we've been in a, um, I've been fortunate enough to work in a medical setting where I've been able to get the supplies I need, order the labs I want, but this is not always the case with this current pandemic. You know, this not only challenges us in the way we treat our COVID patients, but also our non-COVID patients, whether it's an invasive placentation case or um, the postpartum hemorrhage that may need a blood transfusion. Um, delivery planning for a PUI or confirmed case um, has been challenging. Um, you know, at first we really focused kind of on the aspects of the actual delivery during a vaginal delivery or cesarean section, but as we all know that, as we all know, labor can be um, often unpredictable. So, you know, thoughts of like whether the patient is multiparous, malliparous, how long are we going to let a COVID patient labor, um, what is the actual indication for delivery, and what are you going to do when, if there becomes a terminal fetal bradycardia or maternal indication for an emergent cesarean section in a COVID case. Um, just as we all know that doing a 2 a.m. cesarean hysterectomy is not ideal, it's probably also not ideal to do these uh, COVID cases uh, for cesarean at, at that time as well. We don't have a clear solution for this, but just some aspects that um, everyone should be considering when they develop their labor and delivery protocols. Uh, another aspect that has been challenging is distributing information in a timely manner. I think we, it is an understatement to say that we have received multiple emails um, and we are clearly getting email fatigue. But we also need to be able to distribute the emails to our colleagues, not just our other MFM partners, but our obstetricians, our midwives, our family practice physicians. And obviously, uh, email is not always the best way. We uh, have, again, set up multiple Zoom meetings in order to kind of alleviate that. And sometimes just even talking on the phone may be the best way to distribute some information. We're we are also kind of at a cross point with our medical education. Um, currently at our institution, medical students are no longer on clinical rotations. Our residents uh, have an altered surgical schedule given that elective cases are all on hold. Our fellows likely will be impacted by our clinic and ultrasound schedules as well. Our uh, junior colleagues who are scheduled to take ABOG especially boards um, next month are now postponed as well. Um, we're still trying to figure out adequate avenues in order to provide teaching for all these um, learners. However, um, the other challenging aspect is we don't know how long this may last. Uh, lastly, or additionally, provider staff and illness. So uh, we acknowledge that, you know, with additional providers being exposed, there will be a subset of us that will be out on illness or uh, should not present to work um, if we do have any symptoms, whether it's coronavirus or not. 
Um, and this will pr prove to be challenging for cover covering the clinical services that we need. Um, already, our residency has kind of encountered this and ha has altered the schedule in order to provide uh, only clinical coverage to the truly needed clinical services. Um, but we realize we all kind of need to pitch in, whether it's having a partner who is out sick, whether you're recovering from a very heavy workload, or whether you're staying home healthy in order to prepare for the next uh, sick person out. And lastly, I think uh, the social stressors to coronavirus are extremely unique. Uh, we've all faced the H1N1 H1N1 approximately 10 years ago, but of course the social stressors of childcare, caring for our elderly parents, um, social distancing, school cancellation provides an additional stress. We're used to providing complex medical care for our patients, um, but the additional stressors outside of work have proved, proven to be challenging for all and uh, just proves that we, we really need to uh, work together for this. So, you know, my pearls are teamwork is essential. Um, you know, we will not be able to do this without each other. It's been a challenging and humble, ex humbling experience, but we know that we can all learn from each other. Um, I do want to thank my uh, division, especially Drs. Edith Cheng, Jane Hitty, and Bonnie Simmons. I will um, be willing to answer any questions as much as I can at the end of the session, and I also uh, will provide my contact information just knowing that I may not respond to your email on the same day. Okay, so thank you so much for that, Dr. Ma, and we'll combine Dr. Ma's slides with mine so that um, this can be shared with everyone. So we're gonna go rapid fire into a few specific queries. The goal of this section is not to give you any specific guidance, but to give you some homework per se, to take back to your institutions if these are topics that have not been discussed so that we're all prepared going into this. And this was um, really drawn from some of the online groups of physicians uh, with questions that have been raised. So I think everybody's input. So I have two buckets and some of these have been touched upon by Dr. Ma already. On the left, I have administrative um, tasks that you should be thinking about. And on the right, some clinical questions. So we'll start with the administrative. The first thing is antenatal testing and ultrasounds, and that goes along with obstetrical prenatal visits. For our high-risk patients, the general consensus is to provide all necessary care for our high-risk patients because obstetrical problems don't stop happening just because COVID is around. However, in order to mitigate the propagation of this virus through the community to practice social distancing, um, you yourself as a group have to decide which visits are potentially could be combined with another. Maybe if the patient is seeing both MFM and OB, perhaps uh, one, uh, only one group needs to be seeing the patient. For low-risk patients, their um, prenatal visits can uh, be adjusted and there's a few different algorithms that you'll be able to find online. Telehealth has been mentioned and that's something that can be, can be considered. I know SMFM is actively working um, with payers to try to figure out if reimbursement can continue via telehealth. OR procedures, Dr. Ma showed uh, her, their example of this. This is our draft um, currently, but basically to make sure that you just have somebody walk through your unit and think about all the potential areas that need to be sealed up um, and uh, to come up with algorithms that work for your specific unit. In terms of immunocompromised staff, and all of us are facing questions like this right now, I'm pregnant, do I still continue to work? And the CDC guideline is that everybody should be following the same social distancing, hand hygiene protocols. Um, and with that, you can absolutely continue to work. Now, if you are in an area that has higher risk procedures, aerosolizing procedures like bronchoscopies or intubation, so if you are an anesthesiologist, um, then you, the facilities will have to determine um, themselves whether or not they want to limit exposure um, to these individuals. But if N95 is properly fitted, then that should potentially uh, mitigate that problem. In terms of fomites, and this is a, a, um, the best graph I've seen from the CDC, which is facial hair that can uh, affect um, respirators. And so this is important that if you have facial hair, this can be considered a fomite. Viruses can live on 
on body surfaces and so perhaps shaving is something that should be considered and we've seen many of our colleagues do that already. Um, furthermore, uh, personal protective equipment and the bodies and our clothing can also harbor viruses. So this is a particularly important time to remind your um, trainees and staff to not go home in your scrubs. In terms of elective procedures, um, none of our obstetrical procedures on LMD are really elective. Um, the only two that need to be brought up and to discuss amongst each group is whether bilateral tubal ligations um, can still happen if your uh, load, clinical load um, significantly increases. And all of our major governing societies in OBGYN have come together to state that um, abortion procedures should not be canceled or delayed because many of those are time sensitive and um, emotionally uh, burdensome for patients. In terms of our trainees, and Dr. Ma touched upon this, I just want to note two additional things. Um, one is to minimize the risk of group exposures. So there's no need for three trainees to be in one room um, if there is a patient under investigation. So we have limited our own sites down to uh, one trainee, if at all. Um, Dr. Um, Lorelei Thornburg has put together an excellent list of resources that are available to fellows if they are quarantined at home or um, just waiting at home to be not on the in-house team. Um, so those will be um, hopefully shared with everyone and we encourage program directors to reach out either via the Facebook group or the SMFM communities to continue sharing ideas. And Dr. Metz mentioned this morning that the Fellowship of Affairs Committee is reaching out to ABOG and ACGME to discuss research uh, requirements given that many clinical trials have and laboratory research have been halted in this pandemic. Lastly, just a note for COVID-19 positive tracking, as we mentioned, sometimes the severity does not escalate until several weeks after onset of diagnosis. So um, every health system needs to institute something either via EMR or via um, hospital ID in order to track and follow up on our postpartum patients along with their neonates. In terms of staffing preparation, Dr. Ma mentioned this, and we've done the same thing at our institution, which is to change to inpatient team versus outpatient team versus home team, and these are rotated on a weekly basis. Um, and again, to minimize risk of group exposures to patients on the floor. That then brings us to the big black box, which are many of the clinical things that we're all hearing about. So very quickly, some of the therapeutic options that have been thrown out are Plaquenil, um, Calitra or Lopinavir or Ritonavir, Tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor, or Serolizumab um, has also come out to have a trial registered. For the Plaquenil data, this just came out yesterday out of France. It seems like they have an N of 24. I can't tell because it's not on PubMed, not peer-reviewed yet, but it seems to be a, a randomized control trial to Plaquenil versus routine management, and they showed a decrease in viral transmission and um, and uh, a significant decrease in the time to uh, limit viral transmission. Calitra data, unfortunately, um, out of China showed no benefit, and the, to, the IL-6 inhibitor trials are currently ongoing, and um, SMFM, along with our other societies, have also reached out to the NICHD and NIH to discuss use of this medication in pregnant women should it become necessary. Another question that we've raised in our group is nitrous oxide. Um, and given the potential for leakage from the mask, um, a law, which has been shown, the occupational health websites for CDC note that nitrous oxide does indeed leak into the air and there is occupational exposure. So it is up to your groups to determine whether you want to limit nitrous oxide use in patients who are under investigation or confirmed, or potentially limit all use during this time since many patients are not diagnosed until after delivery. In terms of steroid use, I touched upon this earlier. Again, the Rasmussen Jameson uh, uh, summary says to avoid use. WHO also has a statement that says to avoid use unless indicated for another indication, which brings us to the MFM issue of do we give antenatal corticosteroids? And this is something that each institution needs to decide on your own. Um, the main concern about steroid use in viral infections is that it could potentially worsen the pulmonary outcomes. 
um, so there were reports of, of um, uh, decreased viral clearance, worsening pulmonary status, along with steroid-induced psychosis. The doses of these steroids that are used in these studies are 300 milligrams of hydrocortisone, which is equivalent to our betamethasone 12 milligrams. However, they do use this for much longer than our two doses. Um, so it's important for you to yourself to call the data and determine what you want to do in your institution. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide, which will be in the slide deck that gets sent out, but this is the, the effect of steroids on each of these uh, viral infections, including MERS, SARS, influenza, and RSV. Next question is inductions. Um, there are pros and cons. There's talk uh, in some groups of doing elective inductions now while your state is still in a fairly low uh, case report um, period before everything ramps up in the next two weeks. Um, the pros of that are just to decrease your patient load um, so that the patients who are 39 weeks are electively delivered and that clears up room for patients who might be coming in with preterm delivery, preterm labor. Um, the cons of that would be that you're increasing the patient's exposure in the medical setting um, along with increasing the load on your labor and delivery now while everyone is trying to prepare for those, uh, those areas where you are not um, severely hit yet. So this is something for your group to discuss. Another idea for those who are not currently doing outpatient inductions is to consider outpatient either meso or outpatient Foley um, based on your preferences. Next question is blood conservation and cell salvage. So Dr. Ma touched upon this, which is that um, we are going to be hitting a blood shortage soon. The Red Cross just sent out an urgent request for more blood. Um, so you, your institution needs to ration your blood use. Um, and that means that having cell saver available and um, ready to go for any potential postpartum um, hemorrhage after a section or any cases that are larger from the gynonc world will be helpful so that we don't deplete our supplies. And then lastly, NSAID, um, the WHO, uh, as many of you have seen in the media, there is concern that NSAID may worsen the clinical outcomes. And so WHO has temporarily put out this non-formal statement that says if you don't need it, don't use it. So that's something to consider in our postpartum patients, which is their, um, for pain control, whether NSAIDs should be halted and we change over to Tylenol for now. And this is for my own wellness. I did not have time to put together a wellness slide. So um, this is a slide to remind everyone, as Dr. Ma said, to check in on your team members, check in on yourself, check in on everybody, check in on your patients. And there is a, on baseline level of anxiety that we're all facing, but this is potentially going to be a marathon that we're all facing. So very important that we all try to take note of this and make sure that our trainees and staff and ourselves are taken care of. Dr. Lipkin has very graciously, um, as part of her Thrive Initiative, put together a list of resources, which she posted this morning on the Facebook group, and we'll continue to find additional resources that you may be able to use. And then lastly, for research, there are two trials up and coming. So the first is a priority trial, which is the Pregnancy Coronavirus Outcomes Registry. This is going to be a prospective nationwide registry based out of UCLA and UCSF. We're going to be recruiting all patients who are either under investigation or confirmed. The IRB was approved of, as of this morning, and um, the formal start will be on Monday next week. Dr. Afshar is the PI on this and she is our contact person. There will be a website that will be set up very soon also um, for you to reach us. The MFMU is also going to be, uh, or their statement is that they are also considering a protocol to evaluate the effect of COVID pandemic on pregnant and postpartum women. So stay tuned for that also. And lastly, I just wanna end with a quote from one of our faculty members, which is don't worry alone. We're all in this together. We're all facing the same questions and information sharing is incredibly important right now. So if you're not on a form of social media, join us there because that is a wrap, a quick way to get quick answers. Um, um, but do be aware of social media fatigue also during this time. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Judette Lewis. I do want to point out really quickly that SMFM has multiple free resources that are available to you and to um, your uh, local referring doctors and infectious disease and critical care and ED docs. 
Dr. Cornelia Graves has very graciously allowed us, um, given us time next Wednesday to do her pulmonary critical care lecture. And that will be next Wednesday at 9, um, 9 uh, West Coast time and 12 Eastern time. Um, I've listed the SMFM website. I've listed uh, on which there is the pulmonary critical care bundle where SMFM has released all of its pulmonary um, educational materials for everyone to use. And then lastly, um, the references along with my slide deck will be in this Dropbox here on the QR code. And now we'll turn over to Dr. Lewis. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Chris. Um, Chris Hahn and um, Kimberly Ma, I think um, based on the feedback I'm getting via text messages, this webinar has been very informative for the members. Um, uh, so thank you for taking time out to put this together and to do that. Um, I especially want to thank Chris for um, all of her efforts um, through this. Uh, she hit the ground running uh, fairly early and running quickly and has been a tremendous resource to the uh, SMFM community. And so thank you for that. Um, but I also really want to thank the members. Uh, in the recent couple of weeks, SMFM has been able to respond and put out uh, a record number of uh, work products in a record amount of time. And that really has been due to uh, members reaching out and volunteering their services to help us um, crank through the materials as they're coming through. Um, and also they've been a resource to each other. And so, um, so I commend all of you for that. And um, we are so grateful. And it's a reminder of um, how much of a resource that we can be for each other. Uh, through this all, we've also um, really been able to see the yield of some of our efforts at uh, incorporating more international members into the society because we've been able to learn from them um, as they have uh, experienced this pandemic uh, before we did. I think what's really important, um, you know, for you to note is number one, uh, this webinar was far more popular than we anticipated. People did not, um, uh, they did not uh, register beforehand, and so we exceeded uh, 500 people. Um, we are going to be posting this as soon as possible. So uh, originally we thought tomorrow afternoon, but hopefully sooner than that. And as soon as, as the recording is uh, posted, we will send out um, uh, social media and email and text messages to let you know that it is posted. So all of your um, friends and colleagues who were not able to get on, you can pass on that message. It's also important to think that, to understand that everything we're saying here um, uh, are, a lot of it is not evidence-based and it's not meant to be prescriptive. And so you need to adapt to your own uh, local organizations, uh, depending on what resources that you have. Um, the key is preparedness and what you do may not be identical to um, what is described by um, any of us on this webinar or even your friends um, across the, uh, the country. Um, the other thing we want you to know is that we do have more topics coming up. Uh, two key documents will be coming out. Um, we're hoping at the latest by early next week. Uh, one is um, an L&D protocol uh, so that uh, it can provide some guidance on how to manage these patients who are under investigation or who are um, COVID positive as they come through your L&D units. And the other one is a document that looks at how to, um, how to, uh, set up your uh, ultrasound offices in the day and age of COVID-19. Uh, and so we hope to get those documents out to you fairly quickly. Um, other than that, I want to keep my comments brief um, so that we can get to the questions which I think are uh, really important. Um, I want to thank everyone um, who's been helping with this and I definitely want all of you to take care of yourselves. Um, we are each individuals, we're not all the same. We don't handle uh, the stressful situation the same way. And so leaders need to, rem to remember that they need to find uh, their individual strengths and to allocate uh, tasks and resources based on those strengths. Um, and so with that, we can turn over to answering some questions.
Dr. Lester? Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> so thank you again to all of our colleagues for their time and excellent presentations. We have an additional about 30 minutes left for the questions. I'm going to try to go through um, all of them from the Q&A as well as the webinar chat that you guys have started to put through and you can keep them coming and we'll try to get through as many as possible. So the first one I'm going to take is how confident are we that this is droplet, not airborne transmitted disease? Our staff is deeply concerned about evaluating PUI and known positive patients without N95 masks. So all we have are the recommendations from our national societies, um, which incidentally I noted that CDC guidance never come with references. Um, so the current available data is that there is no aerosolization um, and that it has been, at least from the Chinese data, also has been shown. So as of right now, that's what we go with. Um, but I can't give you any guidance other than that. We have to stick with the national guidelines. Okay, there's another question. I'm at a rural community hospital. Is there any recommendation for tertiary care transfer of COVID patients outside of the typical obstetric reasons for transfers? So if there's pulmonary decompensation, absolutely. I think if it's a mild asymptomatic patient, which again, most of these patients will be, um, as far as we know right now, I don't think there's necessarily a need for a preemptive transfer just because they're COVID positive. But I would recommend that you ha establish a very clear line of communication with your tertiary center so that you know what to do if something happens, that you have somebody out there who you can maybe call if resources are needed. Okay, another question. Were vaginal swabs completed? Was there any information about vaginal deliveries? Um, and then I guess from the same person, so I'll ask it as well, do you have any recommendations for reducing or limiting the use of PPE in the OB setting? So kind of a twofold question. So vaginal swabs have been done on MERS and SARS-CoV-1 um, patients in the past, and there are viral particles um, that have been noted. But again, viral particles are also found everywhere else on these individuals, in fecal matter, in skin, um, in hair. The only place where it has not been reported is urine. Um, so we don't have data yet on SARS-CoV, and hopefully the study um, uh, the studies that's coming up, which is three-pronged, will have maternal outcomes, neonatal outcomes, along with a biospecimens repository um, that will be led by Dr. Stephanie Gaw at UCSF. Um, hopefully with that, we will have better data on um, whether vaginal specimens um, are significantly, have high viral loads. But there's no data at all, um, and I've spoken to many infectious disease doctors and epidemiologists that Vaginal delivery is an aerosolizing event. Okay. Um, the first deliveries in China had infants which did not have transfer of the virus. There was a questionable CDC report where it talked about glutathione and its high concentration in the placenta and how it might be protective. Does anyone have any thoughts on this? That is an excellent question, and I do not have the answer for that. Okay, then let's skip to, we talked a little bit about betamethasone, so this was answered a little bit, but I'd like to just bring up the recommendation of betamethasone in a 34 plus weaker um, or hold for any suspected COVID patient, given we talked a little bit about earlier steroids, but how about the, the late antenatal period? So um, again, there's no societal guidance on this yet. Um, I can tell you anecdotally what we are planning um, which is that um, 34 and above, we would not recommend steroids in somebody who has active pulmonary symptoms or x-ray findings. 32 to 34 will depend on the clinical scenario. If it's very mild symptoms, they have preterm labor, um, I think it's reasonable to consider. And under 32 is when we will be definitively giving steroids unless there's significant maternal decompensation and the intensivists say otherwise. So it really is up to each institution to determine part of it will depend on your neonatology colleagues also, um, whether or not uh, surfactant availability is an issue, whether um, their resuscitation abilities are uh, as robust 
as some um, major centers. So that's something you should discuss as a multidisciplinary team. Yeah, I will say at the University of Washington, that is our similar thought that we will not be getting late preterm steroids to this cohort. Dr. Okay, Lewis, and as a follow, follow I'm sorry, Judith. <laughs> Do you guys have any current plans for steroids? Um, so from our perspective, um, you know, same, same as what everyone else is doing, um, you know, the, if they have clear indications and severe preterm, sure, um, but we're not doing late um, steroids and certainly not doing steroids um, just for the disease process itself, only for prematurity. Okay, there's another comment. Um, can you comment on how you have changed your antepartum testing protocols? That's kind of a really long question, but if anyone has maybe a quick answer to that, that would be great so we can move on to other questions. Yeah. So we have gone through our list to determine which are indications that truly require antenatal testing uh, versus fetal kick counts at home. Um, so any patient who, you know, had a mild indication, so advanced maternal age over 40 and is otherwise low risk, those are individuals who may be able to back off on their antenatal testing. Um, we have trimmed down some of our twice a week testing to once a week. Um, and um, we've come up with a list of who are the truly high risk patients who must continue with their um, currently current protocol. Dr. No, um, Oh, yeah, I mean, our other consideration is if you are already doing an ultrasound for something like AFI or Doppler, that perhaps you just include your BPP in with that to avoid doing an additional NST um, at that time um, as well. But yeah, we are of the similar thought. We have to kind of think of each patient and each indication to determine whether antenatal testing is truly indicated. So there's a comment in Washington State, the test results take 48 to 72 hours, so PUIs should be treated as positive cases then is the question. I'll let you take that one, Dr. Ma. Yes. Uh, well, I am also fortunate that I work at the University of Washington, so our testing results are a little bit quicker since our testing is in-house. But yes, typically PUIs are treated as COVID positive until their um, testing comes back. And so if you're at a time of whether you should deliver or not, and it's an elective procedure, then we typically, or an elective like repeat C-section, we typically will delay the C-section as long as maternal and fetal health are stable until we get those results back. There's a question about suction DNC for missed abortion. Does anyone have any comments on how you might care for someone who's either a PUI or COVID positive? You know, this question came up at our institution as we're discussing um, what is elective versus not. Um, we have not stopped elective procedures yet. Um, uh, certainly, we, you know, we discussed, you know, trying to use other modalities because the, the discussion is not just, um, you know, for the patient, but also the occupational hazard for anesthesiology and for us, et cetera. And so we're possible um, utilizing other options such as, you know, Cytotec or um, manual vacuum aspiration. Um, but if not, if you do need to um, do a, a suction DNC, depending on what the indication is, um, uh, proceeding with that. Um, and certainly if it's an abortion, that's, um, not elective, but if it's an, an early missed AB, maybe you have other options. And our uh, family planning folks have been phenomenal with making sure that these cases are continuing um, and also reaching out to local providers to let them know that if they themselves are unable to perform the procedures, um, that uh, being a tertiary center, we will absorb them. So a question about OBORs, they're not normally negative pressure rooms. Are there thoughts specifically for cesarean deliveries? Yeah, we're addressing that question also because um, 
cesarean section operating rooms are typically positive pressure rooms. Um, so uh, the current thought is that um, you, all the providers will just don the personal protective equipment as mandated by CDC um, and that there will, the room will not be used afterwards for several hours to allow it to clear and to fully clean, um, uh, clean the room. Yeah, and we also um, have worked with our main OR staff too. So depending on what your L and D setup is, you know, our there's two of our ORs that are connected by the same antechamber or scrub area. So essentially, if you uh, have a patient in one OR, you're essentially closing both of those ORs. And so logistically, it's going to be very individualized on what your L and D setup is, as well as what your main OR resources are on where that patient should be thus delivered. This question is specifically to Dr. Ma. How has your experience with COVID-19 been with pregnant women? Is it consistent with prior reports? But I, I would argue everybody can contribute if they've seen pregnant women who are COVID-19 positive. Um, so far it has, but I would say we still have had a very, uh, although our state, you know, was one of the first, we still have had um, a limited, um, only limited number of cases at this point. There was a question earlier, how many cases has everyone seen? Is that something that can be shared? <laughs> Fortunately, zero. Sorry. Um, uh, only a handful. Okay. And I think with the registries up and running, um, we will have data within the fairly soon. And we'll try to get that pushed out as soon as possible. I'm going to try to skip some that are mostly been answered. Um, can you discuss the association between antihypertensive medications and COVID-19 and any thoughts in particular um, on medications to utilize in the perinatal period in light of this? So the only real discussion that has been had are ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which is why I didn't mention it because in our population that's not something we commonly use. And the concern is that uh, due to the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, 2 being the host receptor um, that ARBs and ACEs may potentially worsen outcomes because downregulate, but because blocking of the ACE one receptor would then upregulate your ACE two uh, receptors. So my only recommendation is in the postpartum period, if you have a patient who you were thinking about putting back on ACEs or ARBs, to hold off if they are suspected COVID. But again, not formal guidance. So another question just to try to move through, given limitations of negative pressure rooms, the risk of pulmonary deterioration and the need to optimize fetal oxygenation, would you suggest reducing goal O2 sats below 95% to reduce, quote, excessive intubations as requested by our anesthesiologists? That's an interesting question. I think for now, um, the 95 4% goals should um, still be kept, but as our burden of disease starts to increase, that's something that each institution can certainly discuss. Um, Dr. Ma, do you have any input on this one? No, I think, I mean, I think that situation would need to be individualized, unfortunately. Um, I, don't, I don't have any definitive guideline for that. Yeah, I agree. So important question that's been floated around quite a bit. Can you please advise us how to preserve PPE? <laughs> Any guidance on reusing of masks, surgical with visor or N95? So um, there is a lot of concern about lackage of PPE, but it's important to remember that most hospitals have enough for right now. What we're talking about is down the road. Um, and there are factories that are actively being converted over to N95 production factories. So there are plans in place. Um, there are many posts about people having access to masks and um, looking for places to give them. So I think because, at least for the areas that are just starting to pick up, we are so ahead of the curve right now in preparing. Um, I don't think we'll hit the shortage that we're all 
disappearing. Now that said, um, preserving is something that each institution will have to decide. Um, even our own institution right now is still not sure about if we have a quota on PPEs, especially if it might be a fomite, do we want to be holding on to it and taking it home? Um, so those, those are things that we don't have specific guidance for. Dr. Ma, do you have any from your end? No, we've just been working closely with our institution in infectious disease about um, PPE conservation and just I think just even being aware of um, the conservation and utilization is also helpful as well. But we have gone to things such as, um, you know, utilizing hand washing over hand sanitizer. If a room has a sink, you know, cons considering that because when you're donning and doffing, you definitely need hand sanitizer for that stuff um, instead of for some of the routine uh, visits that we have. So we have looked into that as well. And one other thing that um, some people have experienced is I'm hearing um, anecdotes across the country and certainly we experience that as the anxiety mounts, um, you have to secure the PPE that you have. Um, unfortunately, even our own healthcare workers are, you know, masks are disappearing and we had 25 bottles of hand sanitizer disappear. And so you, um, you know, it, you wouldn't think that this would happen in times of crisis, but it does. And so um, you need to think about securing what PPE you have. A follow-up question yeah. that just came in, if it isn't airborne, why do we need N95 masks? So the current recommendation is that you don't. Um, so for even if it's a confirmed COVID positive patient, if they are not undergoing an aerosolizing procedure, you technically do not require an N95. That's the CDC and WHO's current stance. Um, if it is an aerosolizing procedure, then yes, you do need it. So if you have a patient who is undergoing a cesarean for an accreta and needs to be intubated and has COVID at the same time, that is some, a case where everybody wears N95 masks. Um, eyewear should be worn at all times um, just because of droplets uh, potentially being splattered, but um, N95s are based on national guidelines, not required. And a follow-up as well. Did someone say that pushing in labor was considered an aerosolizing case <laughs> or procedure? <laughs> just oh. to clarify. <laughs> Uh, our institution is. So anyone who is going to be within six feet, within six feet of the patient during stage two, you know, during labor, we consider that um, needing an N95 for that. Um, and this, this is a debate that we've been having with, within ourselves right now, too. So um, still waiting for hospital epi to get back to us. But um, if we were to follow national guidelines, technically, no. Correct. We've been debating this for over two weeks, so it's not something we we came to a decision to lightly. Okay. And other concerns that have been um, heard a few times. Do we have guidelines that we can advise our pregnant and lactating healthcare providers? Um, just the CDC guidelines that I alluded to, um, which is that if they are pregnant assuming that they are not in an aerosolizing situation, they can continue to work. Um, facilities can determine whether telehealth can be more available to these individuals, maybe lower risk patients, but that will really depend on your staff burden at any time, especially as some of our colleagues start to get quarantined. Um, and the, the quarantines are you know, just prevention measures so that we don't further spread within our institutions. Okay, um, this one says, we are a large private practice with 10 offices. We are planning to make a single office, an isolated office for PUI and known positive patients. Do you think this is an appropriate strategy or are individual rooms at each site with appropriate isolation and disinfection easier? And an additional note for Dr. Lewis, please send us any recommendations for outpatient ultrasound units. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to assume that the question was regarding outpatient offices. Um, so in general, if you have a PUI or COVID, um, the recommendation is that they not be in your healthcare setting. 
um, that if there is an evaluation to be done, that they are done in a centralized testing center. So you've seen the tents that are going up, the, the urgent cares that have been converted into PUI. Um, but if there is somebody who ha is symptomatic, they go to triage or emergency room, depending on gestational age. Um, but there, I don't see any particular reason that obstetricians and MFMs need to be evaluating COVID um, on an outpatient basis. Dr. Ma, do you have any input on this one? Yeah, that's um, what we've been trying to do at the University of Washington is to centralize. So um, just on Monday, we, uh, the University of Washington rolled out drive-through ambulatory testing. Um, you know, there's all, many advantages to drive-through testing versus actually bringing the patient in. It's a high, high utilization of PPE and turnaround rooms. So we've been able to utilize uh, uh, that for ambulatory testing. Uh, for inpatient testing, that obviously is a little bit um, more refined either through the emergency room or labor and delivery depending on your setting, of course. But um, as far as consolidating offices, um, I, you know, I think some of that also has to do with the location you're at and how far, far you at, far the distance between your offices. We have also looked at um, consolidating offices, not just for provider, providers, but for also patients um, to utilize as well, because we do anticipate there will either be staffing shortages um, and also decreased need for, you know, visits or that can be otherwise done through telemedicine. I think the question actually was referring a little bit more to the antenatal testing and COVID positive patients. So there's a follow-up question that might help answer um, the, or ask the same question. There has been discussion on spacing out prenatal visits, but do you have any recommendations regarding antepartum fetal surveillance? So again, NSTs, modified BPPs, BPPs, and spacing giving risk to the clinic, and then kind of tagging on that, that last one, maybe um, on a COVID-19 positive patient, how antenatal testing could be done or should be done in the outpatient settings. Got it. So COVID patient comes in, goes home, and needs antenatal testing. I think I understand. Yeah. So um, we, we talked about the general antenatal testing ad adjustments that can be made. Um, and Dr. Ma, feel free to step in because I have yet to encounter this scenario myself. But if there were a woman who needed antenatal testing, I feel like inpatient triage might be the best scenario. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if you want to bring that into the hospital. Um, Dr. Ma? Yeah, I think it would just ultimately, I would think it would ultimately depend on what the gestational age and also the indication for the antenatal testing. Um, I will say just last night, I think Dr. Bergella came out with a piece of uh, an AJOG MFM about um, alterations to antenatal testing uh, or what has been done in Italy. Again, this is just based on expert opinion, et cetera, but that would be also something to consider as well. But I think it would be hard, it, it would be hard to have a blanket statement unless, um, without knowing the indication or gestational age of the, the reason for antenatal testing, but it will have to be individualized. And this is, the, this is one of those areas where your local resources make a difference, right? Because um, for sure, now that we're canceling um, a lot of elective visits, you have more uh, open rooms if you're in a larger center. And so the people with more room can set up a designated space um, like, like what we're doing. Um, because, uh, right, because there's two things. There's a the real risk and then there's the perceived risk that then just helps patients with their ease of mind. Um, uh, so I, it, again, it has to be individualized, but just know that some people are doing that, that they're setting up a separate place, but also going with the notion that if you're high risk, you're really high risk. Um, now you can come up with criteria. I, I have to say um, some people have shared their criteria and you know we differ so much in terms of what we do at baseline for testing, you know, like at my center, we don't do AMA testing until later in pregnancy. And so, you know, some centers are saying, well, now we won't do antenatal testing until 37 weeks or 39 weeks for AMA or whatever. Um, and so that's where it has to, you have to look at your individual protocols at baseline and then 
how you can, um, you know, space things out if, if they were softer indications for testing. Thank you. So I want to address this because we talked about the preterm labor risk. There's a should magnesium sulfate be used or avoided? Other tocolytics that we should avoid, if any. So there's no data yet on magnesium in these um, scenarios. Um, so it'll just be a matter of the severity of their pulmonary disease and whether you think magnesium will further compromise their pulmonary status. So again, case by case basis. And then in terms of tocolytics, um, I have not seen any data on tocolytics in these women. Dr. Ma, any comments to add? No, I would agree. It would just depend on uh, the severity of uh, their pulmonary disease and possibly the gestational age if you're using magnesium for neuroprotection. Um, and then also, uh, you know, there's no data out there, but obviously in indicin might be one that you would want to avoid given that it's an NSAID. Okay, how about a question of, are you seeing patients with false negative COVID testing, which they define as positive on repeat testing? Anybody seeing this? Uh, I have not, but I don't think we have reached uh, that wave yet where we are having repeat testing performed quite yet. I think we're reserving resources for all the first time testings. Um, I have a, if betamethasone is not available at an institution and dexamethasone is available, steroid, would the same reasoning regarding steroids apply? Yes because the betamethasone dose and the dexamethasone dose plus the hydrocortisone 300 milligram dose, is they're all equivalent. Okay, and how about we've been canceling all elective GYN procedures, visits, annuals, et cetera. What are your thoughts on seeing routine low-risk prenatal patients? Should we be spacing those out, completing them um, virtually or over the phone? Um, so I could tell you our protocol. Again, this is not societal guidance. Dr. Bagella's paper may have some information, but um, it came out too late for me to incorporate into the slides here. Um, so what we're asking is for the first visit to be at 10 weeks for low-risk patients, where they have their viability check, their dating, their um, NIPT drawn, or their first trimester screen drawn at the same time. At the 12 week mark, they'll have an MFM visit for nuchal translucency and that will um, prevent them from needing to see their obstetrician again for a few weeks. 16 weeks for the quad screen if they decide they want that. 20 weeks will be an MFM visit for anatomy scan that replaces their prenatal visit. So that means that uh, blood pressures and urines are checked in, our, checked in at the time of their ultrasound. And then after that, we've spaced it out to 26 weeks uh, 32 weeks, 36, then 38, 39, 40. Um, and there's many variations of these recommendations going around. It really just depends on your patient population. Are you in an area where patients will tolerate not seeing your OB for six weeks? Um, or in some cases, almost two months if you're seeing an MFN, do you need to set up telehealth to check in with them emotionally with um, you know, any skin rashes or any other symptoms they might be having? So those are all things for you to consider re with regards to your patient population, their risk, their anxiety level. Okay. I'd like to be cognizant of people's time. Gabby, do you have any idea of whether or not we can and should continue or should we start to wrap up? We have lots of questions still. <laughs> um, I'm happy to go through, but I want to be cognizant of people's time. Yeah. Um, on my end, I'm okay for another 10 minutes, I think. Yep. Some of the questions I'm looking at them too, they're really okay. specific, so I'm not sure if it's if it will be if it'll really work, or you guys will be able to respond to some of these. Yeah, I'm trying to pick some that are a little bit more um, broad. Mm -hmm. um, this yeah, this is one that's come up a little bit. What criteria would you use for a COVID positive healthcare provider to return to work? While it's going to be what you guys use at your institutions, I think each of your respective institutions would be important to to share with what what's been working or what what you're using. So our recommendation is 14 days. 
Dr. Ma? Uh, that would be correct as well. Um, let me see. How about any guidance regarding administration of O2 via face mask or nasal cannula? Does face mask, administ face mask administration cause aerosolizing of droplets? Um, there's been some talk about um, nasal cannula administration with face mask over um, patient out of Italy. So asking what the standard should be, if, if any. Um, there's not enough data on that. I know Dr. Uh, I think it was Dr. Pilu's um, webinar mentioned this, um, but we don't have data on that right now. And I think if you're if it's a patient who you are investigating or who is confirmed, you'll be wearing um, personal protective equipment um, anyways. So I guess the question is whether or not N95 would be needed in the case of a nasal cannula, and I do not have guidance for that. Yeah, and I think it would just be maybe an indicator to know, like, why they're on nasal cannula. Are they at risk for needing for further decompensation and needing intubation, possibly? Okay, and as we discussed the separation of mother and newborn, after separating the mother and newborn, who is the infant being discharged to? Does anyone have an ability to comment on that? Healthy caregiver. <laughs> Correct. We're still working through that process, but we are in line with the CDC recommendation to separate, unfortunately, which is, I know, very difficult. Can you discuss a threshold that you might use for determining delivery versus maternal resuscitation, considering delivery can increase mortality for mother, but also can improve maternal status once pregnancy is delivered? I think that question is going to be gestational age dependent. How about delayed cord clamping? Um, it looks like, is there any kind of advice or not in COVID-19 confirmed or even PUIs? That's an excellent question. We keep getting questions and we've yet to work through. <laughs> um, I can't think of a reason not to. Um, Dr. Ma, do you, have you guys changed your course? Yeah. Thing? No, we have not, but that is an excellent point to bring up. Um, it, it, you know, certainly for the preterm infants, I don't, I don't see that I would still continue delayed cord clamping. Definitely if there is any like maternal or neonatal resuscitation needed, then perhaps um, we would not do delayed cord clamping in that scenario. Any recommendations about sonographers routinely using or not using masks while scanning patients who have screened negative? So in our offices, um, we are, we've instated temperature checks upon entry into the unit. Um, all patients have been called to not come in if they've traveled recently or have URI and symptoms. And therefore, with all of that screening, um, there's really no indication to be wearing a mask. Um, so currently, we are not. Correct. So we also confirm with patients the day before, which is very time intensive for our staff, but to confirm that there are no URI symptoms. And then our our main MFM clinic is actually in the hospital, and our hospital only now has really two entrances that you're allowed through, so that all patients, so that everyone is screened through that as well um, before coming in for a routine ultrasound. And just so, to follow up on that, um, we've all seen pictures of um, areas in Hong Kong where everybody is wearing masks. Um, and that is a bit of a cultural difference. Um, in Hong Kong, it has been routine for people to wear masks for over a decade now. Um, and so for that population, escalating to wearing N95s is not anything that, was, um, that they even gave a second thought to. So um, there's gonna be very differing opinions between Hong Kong um, in other societies. And so I just wanted to make a note of that. And that's hence the discrepancy. That we've talked about pregnant healthcare workers. There's a question about um, spouses of pregnant 
or um, spouses of healthcare workers. So four pregnant spouses of EM, ICU, or other high-risk doctors on the front lines. Are there additional isolation procedures and precautions these families should consider? Um, so what I'm recommending to my high-risk patient, patients in high-risk scenarios or with spouses in high-risk scenarios is um, no wearing of scrubs into and out of a hospital, which everyone should be following. Um, potentially, or taking a bath as soon as you get home, really good hand hygiene. Um, and since we know that hand, appropriate hand hygiene can eradicate the, uh, the virus from surfaces, that should eliminate your risk um, of bringing the virus home. Yes, I would agree with that as well. Sorry, I'm trying to go through quickly. I think we're kind of wrapping up on new yeah. questions. I see one question about aerosolization again, and this is going to be deba debated over and over. I know there were a few webinars this week where aerosolization is mentioned. So I'm um, not involved in the CDC. Um, but I am sure they have their eyes on all of this. And if there is a uh, more data that comes up that aerosolization is indeed a concern, um, I'm certain that they will be uh, on top of that. I think a last question that's different that I haven't been able to pull before is any, um, where did it go, about twins. I had a thing. Is there any specific concerns about twins at this point? Oh, there it is. I think the main concern would just be pulmonary capacity. Um, so in the same yeah. way, twins, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. I think in the Italy um, case series, they had only one set of twins out of their 18 mothers. So we don't really have a lot of data for twins. Great. Well, I think we're 10 minutes past what we had expected for Q&A. And I know we could all sit and talk for many, many hours on this, but we do want to respect the time of our um, presenters as well as everyone on this call. Um, we certainly have had more people than we anticipated, and I thank everybody for their time. Um, and then I, we will be able to post all of these slides as well as the lectures on the SMFM website. Just please give us time to do so. And um, feel free to send along any questions that weren't answered. Um, but again, we tried to, to touch on most of them. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.